So, um, my name is Venko Muyankov and uh, I'm a solution architect at uh, Storpool. Uh, maybe some of uh, you know Storpool, but for those who don't, we're making uh, software-defined storage. Uh, my today presentation is about uh, how we KVM and how we get uh, the maximum performance of our KVM hosts. So let me first uh, tell a few words about Storpool. I know that this is a uh, cloud stack and uh, Ceph event, but uh, just to give some uh, background and why we'll talk, uh, why Storpool will talk about KVM. So uh, <coughs> as I said, at Storpool we are doing uh, software defined uh, uh, storage for uh, clouds especially enterprise clouds. We started about uh, almost 10 years ago when uh, software-defined storage was uh, uh, a known word. Very few people uh, know and use this word and much before it became a, a buzzword. Um, and uh, <coughs> Storpool is a software that runs on a standard Linux servers and make uh, scalable uh, storage. Uh, when it was created, uh, it was designed from ground uh, uh, to solve many of the problems of the uh, existing storage systems, both uh, software-defined and uh, uh, sound systems. And the main uh, features that were built into the system uh, were and, and still are uh, <coughs> scalability, reliability and availability, uh, high performance and uh, rich feature set needed for uh, that are needed for uh, clouds and for cloud operators. So, because Torpo is used in many uh, clouds with uh, different uh, orchestrations, uh, of course, cloud stack, but also uh, there are open stacks, some open nebula, and some other proprietary systems. Uh, we have a very good visibility on uh, how different uh, clouds are implemented and how uh, especially KVM is used because the vast majority of the uh, clouds are running uh, KVM. Uh, so through the year, uh, through the years, uh, we gain uh, knowledge on uh, uh, on building clouds and optimizing uh, uh, cloud system based on KVM, of course, with, uh, with the big help of our customers and partners. And uh, in this presentation, I would like to uh, share with you uh, some of this knowledge and uh, uh, the lessons that we learned uh, so you can uh, benefit from this. So, we'll, I'll talk about performance. Performance will be the most uh, mentioned word on this presentation. Uh, but why we we'll talk about uh, performance? First, because performance of the hypervisors directly affect the performance of the uh, end applications. Uh, and uh, it will give uh, uh, lower time to for example, to load the page or to complete the transaction. But more important, uh, with uh, uh, needed performance, you can do the job. And if you don't have the required performance, uh, your system might not work at all. For example, if you have uh, several seconds to load a page, uh, the, the page or to complete a, a, a query, then uh, the system will not work at all. So you need the, the, the required level of, uh, of performance in your system. Uh, then, of course, uh, you need uh, happier customers. If you're talking about public cloud, it will be just uh, the end users. Uh, if you're talking about private cloud, it is the difference between you are able to do the job and or not do it. For example, uh, if uh, the CI CD system would able to to to, to build your uh, uh, latest code on time and your developers can uh, uh, work and their workflow is uh, uh, convenient and uninterrupted, or uh, they have to spend uh, half of their time uh, waiting for the system. And uh, the other reasons are purely economical. Uh, to get more from the same system or to get more uh, for, uh, from, to get more uh, uh, delivered resources uh, from uh, lower investments. Uh, so I'll give you uh, some examples here. Uh, here is a benchmark that uh, 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 that we've made that uh, shows different performance. Uh, here are listed some of uh, uh, popular and not so popular uh, operators. 
how we can read this uh, chart. So it shows on the uh, x uh, axis the time to complete the transaction. So the test was made with uh, Pitch Bench uh, on uh, PostgreSQL uh, server. Uh, on the x-axis is the time to complete the transaction and it shows how this time depends on uh, the load of the system. So these uh, providers are basically running uh, very similar hardware. They are all based on uh, x86 Intel processors. Uh, they are using some storage system. So the virtual machines are pretty much the same. They were selected uh, with the same par uh, parameters, but you can see uh, very different performance uh, between different uh, 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 providers. And for example, if we have a Where is my mouse? Oh, here it is. So if we have a load of about uh, 2000 transactions per second, that's our sustained load of the system, then we can see that with the first four providers, they should be green, okay, let's say uh, yellow, uh, violet, orange, and gray, uh, you can do the job, uh, although with a different latency. Uh, but uh, if you're going to, to this provider, that is the blue one, then it's not capable to, 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 to do the job and to run this, uh, to maintain this uh, 2000 transaction per second, no matter what latency uh, uh, it will give. So that's why we need to, uh, to make our system to get the maximum performance or at least the performance that we need to, to do the job. So in, uh, in this presentation, I'll split uh, the task of uh, uh, optimizing the KVM hypervisor in uh, uh, several parts. First is uh, related to the hardware. Uh, what, how, not what, but how we can uh, select the hardware that fits our need. The second part is optimizing uh, the uh, operating system, uh, CPU and memory usage and settings, uh, then uh, net opti op optimization of the networking and the last uh, storage. So these are the main components in, in your cloud system. So when we are selecting hardware, we usually uh, want to get more for less cost, but uh, what does it mean to get more is uh, different depending on on the task that uh, uh, that you have to solve so there are typically two uh, main uh, goals the most uh, uh, the, the usual goal that's probably 90 percent of the cases is to get the lowest cost we are looking for the lowest cost per delivered resource again this can mean different things and there is not a single uh, uh, solution for this, but uh, this is the, the the most popular strategy. So, for example, uh, we need the lowest cost per uh, VM with uh, four dedicated cores at uh, three gigahertz and 16, 16 gigabyte of dedicated RAM. Uh, the other uh, more unusual uh, case is, but it's still valid, is we need to get a, a best performance. Uh, no matter what's the cost. So this could be the, the, the case when there are some limitation, for example, on the uh, space, but more often uh, because of the licensing reasons. So some, some licenses are based on the CPU or on the core, and uh, the only way to optimize the system is to get the maximum performance per core, no matter what, what's the price of the, of the hardware, or of course, to certain limits. So when we are going with, with this strategy, it's very important, especially when we are go going to the, uh, for lowest cost per delivered resources, it's very important uh, to calculate uh, the total cost. This is something that uh, uh, we have seen that many uh, people missed uh, or skipped some of the important uh, uh, cost components. So we need to include uh, uh, 
the entire hardware, but also the power cooling space, uh, the cost of the network, even when we are selecting hardware, because it also uh, affects on, on, the, on the best choice, uh, any licensing, uh, maintenance and support, installation, and so on. So uh, the better know we have, uh, the better knowledge uh, we have about the total cost, uh, this will give us a uh, more optimal uh, uh, choice when we select uh, the hardware. So when starting with selecting the hardware, of course it's better if you have uh, more flexibility so we cannot just uh, choose from a uh, few uh, models uh, of servers for uh, uh, a limited choice that we have, but if we have an option to select uh, uh, individual components of the server. So if we start with the CPU, uh, it might seem uh, easy to us to select the, the best CPU for, in terms of cost per delivery resources, but it's not uh, as simple as it uh, initially may seem so. Uh, for example, uh, Intel in their uh, uh, latest uh, Xeon scalable generation 2 uh, have more than 60 uh, CPU models. And uh, in this number, I'm not counting uh, generation one Xeon scalable, not counting uh, Xeon E-series uh, processor, and we're not talking at all about uh, Core i processors here. So uh, if we add to this number also uh, AMD EPIC uh, processors, then we are going, we're talking about uh, choosing from a list of uh, probably more than 200 processors. Uh, to solve this task, yeah, and there is no a processor that you can say this is the best one, even when we are talking to uh, lower cost per, per resources. Uh, uh, depending on uh, the cost structure, the best uh, CPU uh, is different. To, to help with this task, we have created a simple tool uh, that, uh, that help us selecting the processors uh, based on the uh, for the specific use case. So uh, we enter in this to uh, the, the parameters that are needed and limitations. For example, uh, we need a CPU core at least of uh, three gigahertz, uh, uh, O-core turbo uh, frequency because this is the, the most important uh, uh, measure of the uh, of the clock, not the base clock or the maximum clock. Uh, we also uh, may have a limitation with a, a power limit per rack. That's very important, and, and very often it was th this limitation is not uh, taken into account. We also have a, a cost per rack, a power cost, uh, a network cost and per network per port costs, uh, initial uh, deployment costs and uh, uh, maintenance, monthly maintenance costs and some other parameters and based on this uh, we calculate, with this tool we calculate uh, the total cost of uh, the different options for the entire, not for the entire server but for entire, uh, when we consider the entire rack of uh, servers uh, taking all the limitations and uh, then this cost is uh, uh, calculated over of, uh, 36 or 60 months or, or whatever number that we need to, uh, to calculate our uh, cost. And, and based on this number, then we can select the best processor. So actually not the best processor, there is not the best processor, the, the processor that best fits to our need. So here are some examples uh, which processors come at the top uh, with a typical uh, parameters. Um, very often it's Xeon Gold 6222V uh, with uh, 20 cores, but if we need a, a higher CPU core, this could be one of these uh, three processors. And uh, this CPU, for example, is, it costs about uh, $3,000, uh, but still in some cases uh, it gives the best cost uh, per delivered resource. For MD EPIC uh, two processors, uh, these are uh, very often the, the, the good choices. Uh, the two are still not completely ready for, for EPIC processors, uh, but uh, we are still working on this part. Uh, but if uh, someone is interested in these two, 
uh, I'll be happy to, to, to share it with, with you. We, we plan to, to make it uh, public, but it's still not, uh, not, not available. So just drop me a note uh, and uh, I'll give you a copy or a link to, to this tool. So it's a Google spreadsheet only. Um, so in, in my presentation, you will not hear this is the proper way to optimize uh, your, your cloud. This is the proper way you have to set your uh, KVM hypervisor, or this is the best hardware you can get for your uh, KVM hypervisor. And uh, this is because in every uh, use case, the best solution is uh, different. So here in this presentation, I will give you the, uh, the approach that we believe uh, delivers best results but it has this approach has to be uh, implemented and for your specific uh, case with your specific environment uh, your parameters so when we're talking about uh, selecting a chassis there are very different options here uh, on the one end of the spe spectrum uh, if you uh, need uh, 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 high density because of the relatively high uh, uh, space rack space cost uh, or uh, maintenance cost per unit uh, then you may end uh, with a chassis like this where you have uh, four hypervisors in uh, to your server uh, into your node uh, but uh, in other cases if, especially if you have a limit power limit per rack for example uh, five uh, six kilowatts this uh, so, so, such type of units are not applicable at all because uh, you will be able only to uh, fill up uh, one quarter of the rack and, and the rest three quarters should be uh, empty. So uh, and, uh, the other spectrum is to, to have a chassis like this one, uh, very cheap chassis uh, without uh, any uh, fancy stuff to you, uh, but uh, it will provide uh, the best cost for uh, uh, for uh, the given resources and uh, uh, of course the density will be much lower but if there are uh, uh, other restrictions this uh, this type of solution will, will be a better choice for you again you have to be very careful when you select this and uh, uh, very important when you are selecting the hardware uh, you shall uh, always uh, think about the total cost at the at least at the rack level, not at uh, server or, or node level. So uh, this is a mistake we have seen uh, often that uh, uh, the hardware is selected based on the cost of the uh, of a single server, but this doesn't fit well if we're talking uh, about uh, the whole rack and or multiple racks. So. Uh, when you're selecting hardware, uh, the, the most important thing that uh, you need to remember is first get uh, as much information as possible about your total cost and, and, and different type of cost that you have and then think at, at least at track level, not at a single uh, node level. <coughs> so when we have our hardware, uh, the next step uh, is uh, to set it uh, uh, the way that you will get the most, uh, the highest performance from this hardware. Uh, first step is update your BIOS to, to, to the latest one. The latest BIOS will almost always give you a uh, better performance. And this is something that we have seen very often is, uh, is skipped by, by many of uh, uh, our customers and because of this they lose a significant performance uh, for example for let's say a hypervisor costing ten thousand dollars that they can lose a, a significant number like more than 10 percent of the performance because of uh, not properly set bios lo directly losing money so don't forget this uh, update your uh, your bios and uh, set it uh, according to your uh, specific needs so your needs may be different again there is no uh, one setting that will work best for all it depends on on, on your environment and what your goal goals are some are looking for a, a, a 
lower power to, to uh, cut the cost, uh, uh, the power costs. Uh, uh, some are looking for get the maximum performance no matter what's the, 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 the power consumption. And some are looking for uh, uh, get a uh, maximum sustained uh, performance. While the, in other cases, the, the, the uh, goal is uh, to get uh, low latency. This means uh, application will, uh, will need to, are very bursty and need to be executed uh, very fast. So these are different settings. And to be able to set this, you need to understand how power management works in, in current system. What are CNP states, uh, performance bias, and uh, these parameters are different for uh, Intel and uh, AMD systems. For example, on AMD systems, there are uh, two, uh, two modes of operation, uh, power deterministic and performance deterministic. And again, you, depending on your case, uh, different one is, is, is the best. So I will not give you here uh, example what you need to, to do, but just to know that this shall be uh, examined very uh, carefully and apply to your specific uh, 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 use case. <coughs> so, setting the in the operating system um, and uh, software part, uh, there is a very good uh, uh, guide for optimizing uh, fine-tuning KVM. It's written by Red Hat. And it's a long uh, URL. You can find it uh, by searching on, on these keywords at the top line. Uh, so uh, also, I will send my, I'll give my presentation to, to the organizers. Yeah, so you can get a copy with with all the links here. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, probably more extensed uh, and. Uh, uh, useful information there. Uh, there are some other uh, sources on uh, different uh, other topics. Uh, uh, check them. Uh, they give uh, some good advice what, uh, how things works and uh, what can be uh, tuned to get a uh, better performance. But no matter what your source of information is, uh, don't just trust blindly on these guides because they are made for a specific case. So I'm pretty sure they work perfect for the guys that uh, wrote this, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's most probably will not be exactly the best setting for, for your environment. So it, uh, uh, they have, uh, uh, with these settings work uh, best for a specific BIOS, for specific BIOS settings, for specific hardware, and solving a specific task. In your case, it might be different. So always perform your own bench benchmarking uh, when you when you are tuning uh, your system. Use these guides to uh, uh, to to understand how you can uh, tune your system. But when you change something, always do your own benchmarking. Uh, selecting kernel and QMU, well, uh, the best advice here would be use the recent stable version. The, the more recent version uh, are usually, usually have a, a higher performance and are more optimized. Uh, I'm not talking about the features and the stability, but uh, about the performance. So usually latest, later version are better. Uh, however, uh, we don't recommend to go with a bleeding edge uh, technology and, and version. And uh, our advice is go with uh, the systems that are very well tested in practice. Uh, what this, does it mean? Uh, CentOS or uh, Ubuntu? Th these are probably together co covered more than 90, more than 95% of all deployments. So they are really well tested. Uh, they're uh, fine-tuned uh, and uh, you will not, uh, they're uh, m more stable and you, it's more likely that you uh, you encounter some uh, weird uh, stuff in both in performance and stability. For uh, uh, CentOS, uh, 
also many of the uh, hypervisors and what we recommend is to use uh, QMU KVM EV package, not the, the QMU package from that's uh, uh, provided with, uh, with the CentOS. The EV package, it is the QMU that's taken from Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization Server and it's repackaged by uh, CentOS. So just add the repository and uh, use this. You don't need to compile it. Uh, it's again very, very well tested and uh, very stable. And uh, this uh, QMU version has a, a pretty good uh, 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 default settings. Uh, for Ubuntu, they are different. Uh, on the guest side, uh, so on, on the tuning, there uh, TuneD admin uh, with uh, two profiles, virtual host and virtual guest, that implements most of the settings that are given in the in the guides on the previous guides in the previ previous slide. So um, um, again, uh, be careful when you blindly apply any settings. Just check and measure. Uh, just a question already. Sure. Sorry for, for interrupting. So when you guys are just uh, checking or, or let's say choosing the camel versions, uh, make sure to understand that even this uh, camel KVM EV from the CentOS Special Interest Group repo is missing on purpose because of obviously commercial interest from Red Hat uh, is missing the possibility to do the live migrations. When you say virsh migrate dash dash copy all storage, it will not work. It did work in CentOS 6. It doesn't work in uh, stock camel versions of CentOS 7. It also doesn't work, or at least up to version 2.12. From this, this repo, it also didn't work. So for some of you, which we, you know that, that might have a really strong uh, need uh, to be able to line migrate volumes, uh, like online storage migration, you know, while, while the game is running, you might be interested to look in uh, the OWIRT, which is kind of, I'm not sure if it's still, uh, actively under development, but they have also a, a flavor of the same stuff, mm -hmm. but with the support to live migrate. So if you have, uh, you know, running uh, things on FS, you want to run you migrate to solid file while the VM is running, you will be not able to do that. That's something I shared with you, Maria. So, so sorry for. The yeah. Question. So you mean a live migration between different storages? Yes. Okay. So, so we're not talking about the, the the most common case when you have a shared storage and live migrating. No, no, that's a VM live migration. But yeah. We're talking about uh, uh, moving VM from one storage to another yeah. while the VM. Is yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing. Okay. So I didn't know because. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it, it was a very, very good command. Thanks. But, but sorry, the KVM yeah. version actually because they repackaging it should be a very very recent delivered. Yeah. yeah, because that's what uh, comparable to over it, right? So you don't necessarily need the over bits. You can just re use the repackaged Red Hat and Libre four nine and Camel two twelve or something like that were some of the more recent that I remember. Yeah, from but that's up to, that's because Red Hat has separately the virtual yeah, yeah. that supports all of this. Yeah, but I'm just saying that uh, whatever versions are running uh, in this specific uh, Camel flavor from the secret group, uh, the, the live migration of storage yeah. for VMs volumes is not supported. Even with the latest so up to 2.12, that's what, what they know. Right, but the RAGV version is newer. Uh, okay, we yeah. can make the same thing yeah. that, yeah. yeah. So, uh, while we're mentioning this, uh, uh, another uh, comment in this area, uh, so, even if you are using a uh, well-established and uh, widely deployed system, you still don't have a guarantee that in your uh, in your setup it will work flawlessly. For example, recently uh, we, uh, with a CentOS update, they updated the libvirt that has a bug and could not uh, properly use uh, huge pages. And many of our customers just uh, uh, couldn't uh, deploy new virtual machines when after they updated their CentOS. So, yeah, there are always some exceptions, but uh, keeping with, with this will save some headaches. Um, <coughs> so, um, uh, 
planning your uh, CPU uh, uh, usage uh, and uh, sizing your system. Uh, there are two approaches. Uh, the, the typical one is with a CPU oversubscription and uh, more unusual uh, is uh, with a dedicated CPUs uh, and uh, CPU pinning. With, well, CPU pinning is uh, optional uh, in this case, but uh, often used together. So, uh, the majority of the cases uh, we use uh, CPU oversubscriptions because uh, VM uh, load is, uh, uh, VMs are mostly idling and uh, the VM load is uh, very bursty. So, you can do your CPU oversubscription without sacrificing the quality and without have a ne negative impact on the on the service. But to to do this, it's uh, uh, really important uh, to know your system uh, uh, and its load, and more important to make a different difference between the uh, oversubscription and congestion. So it's nothing wrong with oversubscription. Uh, but the congestion is something that you always want to avoid. Um, I'll talk uh, about this uh, in a minute. Uh, and uh, also when you're planning your uh, CPU, uh, you need to take into account uh, hyper-threading, uh, numa locality and uh, uh, RQ routing. So hyper-threading, uh, many people uh, think as uh, for hyperthread as a uh, just a standard uh, CPU core that's uh, full features and with a full performance. Well, in many uh, workloads, it is almost this. But in some workloads, the second hyperthread on the on the same core can uh, suffer significantly in performance if there is a load on the first hyperthread. So, for example, uh, you may have on some workloads. Uh, because it's actually the core is only one core and hyperthread is just a set of uh, registers. Uh, if you have a workload that is able to uh, fit all the uh, uh, engines in the core uh, with data, then the, the second hyperthread uh, can get uh, only uh, about 20% of the uh, usual performance that it will have uh, if there is no load on the neighboring uh, hyperthread. So uh, keep in mind, and, and uh, the, the worst is that this is hidden. You, you don't have an indication that uh, you have stalled instructions in the hyperthread because uh, you're waiting for, uh, uh, for some resources in the core. Uh, it's hidden from the operating system. Uh, so keep in mind this, uh, in, many, uh, in many workloads, it doesn't have a, a, such a big uh, impact. Um, Numa locality, if we're talking about uh, uh, multi-socket systems, then uh, try to uh, optimize your data and uh, uh, compute is on the same Numa node. This means that you will not, the, the process that is executed on one socket will not need to access data uh, in the memory uh, bank that are connected to the to the other socket because this will effectively uh, uh, will uh, halve the bandwidth to the memory and uh, uh, double the latency to the memory if you're uh, access accessing uh, the remote memory not the uh, uh, on the local number node. Uh, so again, keeping this this in mind when you're selecting your architecture, uh, if possible, avoid a lot of number nodes too easy this uh, task and uh, uh, also there are settings like uh, 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 I can't remember right now uh, what was the setting that will move the, the data to the to the local NUMA node but anyway this will add some overhead so uh, there are way to be optimized keep in mind that it exists. Um, processing uh, interrupts uh, the best strategy is to route all the interrupts to the cores that are not used for virtual machines, if this is possible. Uh, this is typically a better approach than to distribute RQs across the, uh, all the CPU cores, because uh, this will cause uh, uh, context switches of the uh, of, of the CPUs, uh, cache poisoning, and the, the total uh, performance of the cores will uh, suffer a lot. So if you a lot. So if you 
can uh, avoid this and have a dedicated CPUs for uh, RQ that are not used for a virtual machine. Uh, this usually gives uh, better uh, results. Again, the, 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 the another approach when you have a dedicated CPUs, uh, because you need an absolutely constant performance, uh, sometimes you may need CPU pinning that will also uh, improve the performance because uh, you will not uh, uh, need to, 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 to switch one task from one CPU to another and to gain full uh, advantage of the local cache. Um, so when we're talking about uh, oversubscription, we need to make this uh, clear distinguished distinguishing between oversubscription and congestion. And uh, uh, if you are doing oversubscription, we're not talking only about the CPU, uh, we're talking about oversubscription on, on any resource. Um, it is uh, important to, 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 to make this distinguish and to measure not your load, but uh, to measure the congestion. With a CPU, this can be measured with a, a kernel statistic in, in the scheduler, and this is the uh the, the important parameter is where's my mouse uh is uh the weight queue the time that was spent on the weight queue so this is something that you would avoid uh you, you would want to avoid uh having these numbers uh keep in mind that uh in the the linux kernel documentation there is an error this, these are not in gfs but in uh, nanoseconds um and uh, so you may have a different cases. You may have a hundred percent load with almost no congestion. On, uh, on the other end, on the other hand, you may have a, a system with a, a very low load, let's say twenty percent, but because of the bursty na nature of the load, you still may have a congestion. So measuring the load is not enough. If you have oversubscription, you definitely need to measure congestion. So I'll skip this. Uh, this is actually how uh, how we measure uh, congestion, and these are some examples. Um, memory strategy on memory again, two two types. Uh, typical is uh, not oversubscription of the memory. This is I would say ninety five percent of the cases, uh, and uh, uh, you will have a dedicated RAM. If we have dedicated RAM. We can do uh, uh, normal locality. We can do huge pages that give us uh, better performance. Uh, the unusual is if we have a over -subs uh, subscription, over subscription on the memory. The balloon technique is, as far as I know, already not used at all. Anyone here has used uh, uh, ballooning, or is using today ballooning? Doesn't really no. work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the other technology is kernel same page uh, merging or run the duplication. Uh, the, this one uh, should work, but uh, it's a trade-off uh, between saving some RAM and performance uh, because kernel spend time to uh, search for uh, the same pages and to merge them. And uh, with this trade-off, you may not uh, uh, get uh, with this trade-off, you may not get the, the advantages of uh, uh, oversubscription of the memory. So on the networking side, I'll skip some of this, but again, two, two very different strategies. Uh, uh, if you want uh, absolutely highest performance, then you may go with a PCI pass-through when uh, uh, virtual machine has direct uh, and unrestricted access to the physical PCI device. But with this solution, uh, you lose uh, all the features that you get with virtualization. Uh, uh, you uh, you lose uh, live migration. You lose uh, file loss on the on the host. Uh, you lose uh, uh, SDN functionality. So. Uh, uh, in most cases, you need this feature and features, and you use uh, virtualized networking. Uh, for the guest, uh, there is no more choice. Uh, you use uh, virtual net driver, uh, uh, and uh, on the host, you have uh, two options: uh, virtual that is uh, 
much more popular versus uh, vhostnet. Uh, and also on the host, you have uh, multiple implementations uh, for the virtual networking. The most common one is a Linux bridge, but this is the slowest. Then uh, uh, internal open vSwitch and uh, the fastest one is open vSwitch with uh, DPDK. Uh, the, the last one uh, can uh, give uh, millions of packets per second per uh, dedicated core, but it requires to dedicate a core just for networking on the host. So, do you use something uh, other than these uh, three technologies? I guess these are the, the almost uh, universal today. Um, so, virtual networking, very fast. It uh, uh, evolves uh, many context switching on uh, processing the packet because the packet is generated by the uh, application in the user space in the virtual machine. Then we have a context switch to the kernel to send the packet. Then we have another context switch from the VM kernel. We are doing VM exit to the uh, KVM, to the host kernel. Uh, and then because of the virtual network devices implemented in the QMU process, we have again switching to the user space in the QMU where we process the packet. And then the packet is sent back to the kernel to be sent to the physical uh, network interface. This is very uh, heavy and uh, generates a lot of overhead. With a vhost protocol, this is a, a newer alternative. Uh, we skip all this context switching uh, by using uh, shared uh, huge page uh, huge pa buffers in the huge pages, uh, and uh, uh, they're shared between the, the uh, guest kernel and the host kernel. So w when the packet is set, it's just on the data plane. It's just uh, stored on in the in the shared buffer, and uh, the vhost uh, driver in the kernel. Uh, pulse regularly uh, these uh, uh, ring buffers and send uh, and send process and send the traffic without need of these uh, context switches. And the other alternative is the same, but in the user space, not in the kernel. And this is what OVS with DPDK is actually doing. So uh, the shared uh, buffers is is between the virtual machine and the user space uh, application. Uh, for example, this is OVS with DPDK, and uh, uh, we don't have if it, uh, with DPDK, it used directly access to the network card, so we skip the entire kernel here and, uh, uh, again, do everything without uh, having a, a single context switch. Okay, this is PCI pass-through. I'll skip this. Uh, I guess all of you know this. Uh, the technology that's usually used with uh, PCI pass-through is, is SROUV that allows to define a virtual uh, network interfaces from one physical network interface and uh, assign a different virtual functions to every virtual machine. Um, any questions on the, on the networking? How much time do I have? I'm afraid I don't have. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I Okay. So uh, the last part is uh, storage. Um, <coughs> again, the same two, two, cho two choices. Uh, we can have uh, uh, fully uh, uh, bypass the entire virtualization stack and get the, the maximum performance uh, and uh, losing all the features, uh, or we have uh, all the features that we uh, we actually need, but we will go with a uh, virtualized uh, uh, storage in the uh, uh, virtualized storage stack. So first, uh, with a bypass, we can use the same techniques as uh, with the network. Uh, we can use a local NVMe drive on the host with a, a PCI pass through uh, and SRIOV uh, to give access to the virtual machine. What we are losing here, we are losing live migration. We are losing ability to have a shared storage. So if the node dies, we, we are losing our data. Uh, we don't have a data redundancy. Uh, we are losing uh, features like uh, uh, snapshots, volumes, uh, team provisioning, uh, everything. If we, own, if we need all of these features, so our only option is uh, virtualized storage stack. And with virtualized storage stack, there are a few options that I would say are almost universal. So again, 
test with your system, but uh, most probably you'll get to it uh, with these settings. Uh, first, uh, uh, when you have your uh, virtual uh, block device, uh, you would like to have cache none to bypass completely the uh, host uh, buffer cache. This will give you a better performance and uh, it will save uh, memory, but the most important, it will give you a better performance. Also, you'd like uh, IO native. Uh, this means to use uh, native Linux uh, asynchronous I.O. Uh, in instead of the default uh, POSIX uh, uh, threads. Uh, then you have choices between uh, libvirt block or libvirt uh, SCSI. Uh, different cases, we prefer libvirt SCSI because although it's a bit slower than uh, virtual block in some cases, in many cases, uh, it has uh, more features like uh, uh, discard uh, function that are very useful. Uh, and uh, also allow you to have a Virtio SCSI multi-queue. This gives, uh, this means that in the guest virtual machine, every virtual CPU can use, a you can have a separate queue for every virtual CPU and not only one queue. This gives you a better latency and, and throughput on the operation. This is in the virtual machine. And also uh, enable uh, out threads in the, uh, in the QMU. Uh, this means that QMU will process uh, uh, block operations not uh, with the main thread of the, of the QMU process, but will have a dedicated one or more threads to process the, the IO operations. This will give you a much uh, higher performance than the default setting with using the, the, the main thread of uh, QMU. Um, <coughs> so, uh, typical implementation with uh, uh, Vertail uh, block is much like uh, with uh, Vertail networking. So we have a lot of context switching from the guest kernel when we, when we uh, uh, have a read or write operation. We'll examine here how write operation looks like. From the guest kernel, we have a context switching to the host, uh, uh, to the host kernel uh, through VM exit. Then the host kernel uh, uh, switch the execution again to the QMU uh, process in the user space uh, to, to emulate the SCSI device. Then uh, again, uh, QMU send the block operation to the host kernel to, to, to execute the real <laughs> operation. And it, it, depending on the storage system, uh, it may go to the uh, storage uh, system initiator uh, to complete the operation. Uh, uh, the newer approach, and this is uh, what we are currently working on, and uh, we plan to implement vhost protocol in our latest uh, system, I'm not sure if uh, any system, uh, w what storage systems currently support vhost protocol at the moment, but with uh, uh, with the vhost protocol, again you have a, a shared buffers, and uh, uh, between the uh, uh, storage system initiator process and the virtual machine, and you don't have any uh, context switching. So just the, the virtual machine plays the data on the shared buffer and the uh, st storage system initiator uh, process them and store them. Uh, of course, uh, when the operation are completed, uh, the initiator need to notify uh, the virtual machine that operation is completed. And in this case, it may generate uh, interrupt that is also uh, involves uh, context switching. But uh, if you have a high load, uh, the virtual machine may constantly May still be awake and constantly pulling the the, the buffers, <laughs> so uh, uh, interrupts can be avoided uh, in this direction also. Um, so this is one of the our implementation. I'll skip this. Um, this is how we implement VHOS protocol. Uh, again, all the path is uh, avoiding any context switches. Everything is in the user space, avoiding any switching to to kernel space. Um, storage benchmarking. So everyone want to sell has numbers, uh, and uh, be very careful when you compare uh, numbers. It's a generic not only for the storage, but our uh, uh, observations are on are on the storage market. So. Uh, 
uh, the main problem with uh, the published benchmark uh, reports are uh, the performance number are uh, with the hardware configuration that are totally different than what you will use in production. We have seen uh, benchmark reports, for example, using RAM disk to, to, to give a, a better uh, results. Uh, the other problem is synthetic test does not uh, represent the real use case. Uh, real load would be very different and the behavior of the, of the storage system would be different under uh, real load. So when you're making your own benchmark, try to be as close as possible to the uh, real workload, just not run some tests that will give you IOPS or latency. They are easy to be done, but uh, not always uh, representative about the quality of the system. Um, and uh, uh, demo demonstration of this is for how uh, benchmarking might uh, mislead you. Uh, so any transaction processing system, not only storage, but any other system, uh, uh, lo characteristics look like this. So again, we have the same uh, diagram, how latency depends on the load. Uh, and if you have a low load, we will have some low latency. When we're increasing the load, the latency is also increased to some uh, number. And uh, this is where uh, you have the best service. You have the lowest low, the, the lowest latency for your operation, but you are utilizing just a small percent of the capacity of your system. Uh, what you want to do is you want to operate your system at this point where uh, you are uh, utilizing uh, almost 100% of the capacity of your system. And this gives you lowest cost per delivered resource because you fully utilize your system. Uh, you still have some higher latency, but it is typically within the uh, accepted uh, uh, value. Uh, if the problem with this is that if your load increase, you will get to this point where you will not get more performance, but you get much higher latency and you gain only pain, nothing, uh, nothing more. And the worst is that the benchmark are usually made at that point. So they're completely unrelated to the real workload that should be at best case here, but very often, very often the use case is somewhere here. So make sure that the benchmarks are representing use case. And, uh, okay, I'll skip this, but, uh, well, uh, the, if we have, uh, these are report for, uh, one of, uh, uh, our system in, in production, uh, and, uh, you can see this, uh, we have, a, this system is capable to do about 2,000, uh, 2 million, uh, IOPS, but this is not related to the real use case because no one will use the system here, the, it will be used here. And, uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter, uh, where is this limit? You'll never need this. Even if we are able to, to, to move it to here, you still will not, the, 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 the production use will still not see any difference because you're working at, at this, uh, area here. What really matters is if you are able to move, uh, uh, the characteristics here on the left and lower the latency, and this will have huge impact on the uh, on the applications. Of course, you need your system to have enough capacity to fit uh, your load, but uh, uh, anyway, you need not to work close to to, to do this line uh, or at this line. You you usually work uh, as, at some uh, with some lower load. So. I think that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer them. And uh, again, uh, uh, my email is uh, venkoatstore.com or uh, easier VM. It's not comes from virtual machine, by, but uh, from Venko Muyanko, VM at store pool. It's easy, easier to remember. Uh, if you have any questions uh, later after the, the event, just drop me a note. Uh, I'll try, I'll, I'll be happy to share uh, the information that we have. Uh, yeah, sure. Question, uh, but uh, you said you uh, said something about core pinning. Yeah. Uh, have you looked at uh, thread pinning within Qubit? <coughs> uh, actually, the core pinning is uh, used 
our uh, experience is that core pinning is used very rarely for virtual machines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are using core pinning uh, for uh, dedicated processes uh, that are processing uh, storage operation. So store pool uh, <coughs> operates in a mode like DPDK. We have a, a dedicated uh, we have a dedicated core uh, for uh, processing the uh, storage operation on the host. Yeah. Uh, and to avoid all this context switching mm -hmm. uh, and uh, interrupts and so on. And uh, we are using core pinning on, for, for this uh, process. And uh, when we do this, uh, as on, especially on, on the storage node where we have a, a multiple processes working together at full load, uh, we also are using uh, process uh, uh, core pinning there. And uh, uh, we know which uh, uh, processors work together on the same core, different neighboring hyperthreads on the, on the same core. So when we pin uh, the, 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 the process, we pin it to the logical CPU that's actually a hyperthread. Okay. Is this your question? No, what, what we've seen is uh, we've improved some performance uh, for very specific cases by uh, scheduling the QMU process mm -hmm. on a specific core mm -hmm. and the threads from within the virtual machine on other cores. Yeah. Because if you do a core pinning uh, just with libvirt or uh -huh. with QMU itself, then it will, by default, it will just schedule the QMU process I see. over the cores All the cores, yeah. you are reserving for, yeah. for a virtual machine. Within the virtual machine, so yeah. you still get content switching. Uh -huh. uh, and if you take away the QMU process and just schedule the I see. from within on the cores, mm -hmm. you, you get much less. And do you uh, pin the, the QMU process also? Yeah, so you... But you on a different set of... Uh, we do it via uh, okay. some advert uh, okay. systems and it will it will schedule the, the QMU process away from mm -hmm. the reserved cores if you do it correctly. Yeah, so we, we haven't seen this yet, uh, it's, it's a nice uh, comment. Thanks. Any more questions, Benko? Okay, thanks, Benko. Thank you.